Good evening. Welcome, everyone. I'm Kristen Uhlenbrock. I am going to be your co-host and co-moderator for this series. We're so happy to see so many people tuning in tonight for our Wolves in Colorado Science and Stories webinar series. Um, before I get started, I do want to acknowledge with respect that I and our guest tonight reside on the traditional lands of 48 Native American tribes who now live throughout the American Southwest, Great Plains, and Rocky Mountains, including the Southern Ute and the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, the Apache, the Comanche, and the Shoshone tribes. I also want to say welcome to all of our guests here on Zoom and on Facebook Live. We have a tremendous audience from all across the country, in addition, of course, to a core crowd here in Colorado. Uh, we do want you to engage with us in this series, both tonight and throughout. And for that, we encourage you to ask us questions. You can do that right there in that chat field here if you're on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook Live, go ahead and type your questions into the comment feature. We've got eyes on all of that, and they will be sending myself and my co-host those questions so we can take them into consideration during our discussion portion. I will say now, we are not going to get to all of your questions, but we do love to see them and we read them and we reflect on them. So we encourage you to send them along along the way. So what to expect? This is the first and what's going to be a five part series. And tonight we're going to be talking about the science of restoring wolves to Colorado. In this series, we're going to explore the potential wolf reintroduction to Colorado through the lens of science, policy and lived experiences. We're planning to bring together a really diverse array of perspectives, and we hope that you'll engage with us on this topic and come with a very open mind to learning from everyone. Um, we're going to explore a lot of different angles, and of course, science is really instrumental to us, so we're going to start there first. I want to acknowledge and recognize our partners in putting this series together, really, truly, the thoughts and minds behind a lot of this content. Um, the Colorado State University Warner College of Natural Resources, the Center for Collaborative Conservation, the Center for Human Carnivore Coexistence, and CSU Extension Program. And so, like I had alluded to just a minute ago, I have a co-host and a co-moderator for this whole five-part series. So the director for the Center for Collaborative Conservation at CSU, who is quickly becoming a dear friend of mine, <laughs> the amount of time we spend together, and I am excited to work with him throughout this whole series. John Sanderson. So good evening, John. Welcome and, and thank you for joining us and being part of this series. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, the feeling is mutual. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm really excited about this series. It's been a lot of fun putting it together and I'm thrilled that the moment of being able to share what we have with all of you is just a really exciting opportunity. So thank you for being here. Uh, the, what prompted uh, this webinar series, as uh, probably most of you know, is a ballot initiative that is going to be on the ballot on November 3rd. This was originally referred to as Ballot Initiative 107. It is now Proposition 114 with the title Reintroduction and Management of Gray Wolves. Proposition 114 directs the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission to develop a plan to restore and manage gray wolves and take the steps necessary to begin reintroductions of gray wolves on the West Slope by December 31st, 2023. The proposition also requires the commission to seek public input, assist livestock owners with preventing and resolving conflict between wolves and livestock, and to compensate livestock owners for loss of livestock caused by wolves. Now this series won't tell you how to vote, but we hope it helps you make an informed decision. And you're gonna learn a lot through this series about the complexities around this issue and uh, how science can inform it. And also how in many ways it's much bigger than science as well, or the solutions at least we can say uh, will require more than science. It will require figuring out how we work to navigate Work, work together to navigate a contentious issue. So uh, one quick response, um, we're eager to know if this series has helped you understand and engage in this complex and challenging issue. You've, uh, when you registered, uh, you also received a survey asking questions about your perspective towards wolf reintroduction and management. This survey uh, takes only about five to 10 minutes to complete. 
I know many of you have already completed it. Thank you for that. If you haven't completed the survey, please do. Um, your thoughts and response to that are really important to us so that we can use your input to improve this kind of event, but also you'll be contributing to scientific efforts to better understand how we navigate the complexities of contentious natural resource issues. You will receive another survey, a post-series survey, when this is all over, and we encourage you to complete that one as well. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Krista. Thank you, John. So let me introduce and welcome our two special guests this evening who actually have been very thoughtful in putting this series together too. Um, so I'm excited to hear from them both tonight. Uh, we have up first um, Kevin Crook. So Dr. Crook is the director of the Center for Human Carnivore Coexistence and a professor for, in the Department of Fish, Wildlife and Conservation Biology and a graduate degree program in ecology for Colorado State University. Kevin received his PhD in biology from the University of California, Santa Cruz, banana slugs, right? And he is the <laughs> executive committee for the CSU Global Biodiversity Center. Good evening, Kevin, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks for the introduction. I should say that it's a pleasure being back at the museum because I actually grew up in Denver and I went to the museum many times as a kid, many field trips. I remember the buses rolling in, all the kids pouring out I distinctly remember the saber-toothed cat. You'd put the coin in and it would roar. It was always a crowd favorite. So I, I just wanted to say that it's true to say that both the museum and the Denver Zoo, Zoo were really formative for me in developing my appreciation for wildlife and science. So it's a pleasure to be, to be back. Thanks. Well, we love having you. We love hearing those stories. Sabretooth makes a lot of <laughs> fond memories in people's recollection. I hear it all the time. <laughs> and also our other guest this evening is Stuart Brack. Dr. Brack is a professor for CSU and researcher for the USDA National Wildlife Research Center. And his research is focused on carnivore ecology and behavior and minimizing conflict between carnivores and people. He received his PhD in ecology from CSU and his studies include testing non-lethal methods of preventing conflict, measuring the impact of carnivores on livestock, influence of urban environments on carnivore ecology, and population biology, and behavioral ecology of carnivores. So good evening and welcome, Stuart. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you all for being here. I would say, unlike Kevin, I am not a native of Colorado. I grew up in Texas, so please don't hold that against me. Um, I, I discovered fishing in Colorado as a young child with my grandfather, and that experience just made me have to move to Colorado, and that occurred in 1987 uh, by attending CSU. But I'm really happy to be here and sharing this experience with, with all of you. Us too. I feel like Colorado and Texas have a very close relationship. <laughs> So let's get into the meat of this. Um, John and I are going to take a back seat while the two of you walk us through some slides. And so I think, Kevin, you're going to kick us off first here, and then we'll go to Stuart second. So Kevin, why don't you take it away for us? Okay, thank you. Okay, so well, again, it's a pleasure being here, and, and both Stuart and I really look forward to talking with you about science and wolf restoration. First, just let me give you a little bit more background uh, about myself. I'm a wildlife biologist and, and much of my work has focused on carnivore ecology, including mountain lions and bobcats and coyotes and foxes and bears and wolves. Oh my. Um, I'm also at a director of the Center for Human Carnivore Coexistence at CSU. We're a team of social and ecological scientists and our mission is just to develop approaches to minimize conflict and to try to facilitate coexistence between people and predators. And that, that includes wolves if they're restored to Colorado. On another personal note, I have deep roots here in the Rocky Mountain West. My mom's side was an early pioneer family in Wyoming. My great grandmother, you see her on the left, she was born in the Wind Rivers in the late 1800s. She's there with an elk. Now her son, my grandfather, like myself, was also a wildlife biologist. He started out as a hunting guide around Teton. He eventually became the state game warden in Wyoming and then served on the State Wildlife Commission. 
Now he was an ardent opponent of wolves and he and I had many discussions about this topic. So I feel like I, I understand his perspective and why people, particularly in rural communities, might have negative perception towards wolves. Today, Dr. Breck and I are here as scientists who feel that science should help guide wildlife management and policy. So we're not here to advocate for or against the ballot and initiative, but rather to provide scientific information on the issue. Now, fortunately, wolves are very well studied and there's a large body of scientific knowledge to help guide these kinds of discussions and decisions. So, so what are the prospects for wolf restoration in Colorado? What, what does the science tell us? Well, we know that wolves were once distributed throughout Colorado, but were eradicated from the state by government-sponsored predator control by the 1940s. So for the most part, wolves have been absent for the state, uh, from the state for the last 75 years. But science tells us that Colorado still supports suitable habitat for wolves. Wolves can live in a variety of habitat types and they can persist basically where there's enough prey and where they're tolerated by people, by humans. In the Western US, the best habitat for wolves is on public lands where both of those needs are met. Colorado has over 24 million acres of public lands, mostly on the Western slope. It also supports a large population of mule deer and elk, which are the primary prey of wolves and one of the best predictors of wolf habitat quality. In fact, Colorado Parks and Wildlife estimate that Colorado supports over 280,000 elk, which is the largest elk population of any state. And it also supports over 430,000 mule deer. Now, multiple scientific studies have concluded that Colorado can still support a viable population of wolves. In fact, a review published several years ago by Dr. David Meech, who's one of the world's foremost wolf experts, specifically identified Colorado as being prime for wolf restoration, particularly the Western slope of Colorado. Now wolves are listed as an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act through the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So they're listed as endangered by the federal government. They're also listed as endangered by the state of Colorado. Now important conservation goal for endangered species is that they recover to form a self-sustaining or viable population. And a viable population is one that has sufficient numbers and distribution such that it has a high likelihood of persisting over the long term. Now, some of you have probably heard that over the past year, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has documented a pack of up to six wolves and then another lone wolf in northern Colorado. Now, this small number of wolves in one part of the state would not be considered a viable population for Colorado. These wolves are also at risk. They might be killed or simply disappear as, as happened to the few other wolves that have migrated to Colorado over the past couple of decades. Indeed, there's recent reports that some of the Colorado wolves may have been shot and killed on, on the Wyoming-Colorado border. Now, while protected in Colorado, wolves in Wyoming have no legal protection in most of the state, in the predator zone you see there on the map. That means that they can be killed on site with no hunting license or no hunting season. So this makes it more challenging for wolves to migrate from Yellowstone through Wyoming into Colorado, and it therefore lowers the likelihood that of a viable population arising from natural, natural migration. So ultimately, if, if Colorado wants to restore a viable population of wolves to the state, if that's the goal, then active reintroduction by wildlife managers would improve the odds of achieving that goal. Now, these kinds of reintroductions have occurred for gray wolves in Yellowstone and for Mexican wolves in Arizona and New Mexico and for the red wolf in North Carolina. So if wolves did return to Colorado, what might be the impacts? Well, one concern that is sometimes expressed is the direct threat of wolves to human safety. So what do the facts tell us? Well, we know that in North America since 1900, there have only been two cases of wild wolves killing humans, one in Canada and the other in Alaska. No humans have been killed by wolves in the lower 48 since 1900. Generally, wolves typically avoid humans and direct encounters are therefore rare. So overall, wolves represent little uh, direct threat to human safety. Now, another consideration is the potential impacts of wolves on big game populations and therefore hunting opportunities. So again, what does the science tell us on this? 
Well, numerous scientific studies indicate that under certain conditions, wolves can contribute to local decreases in prey numbers. This is especially when wolf predation is acting in concert with other factors that also limit big game, such as harsh weather, severe winters, human hunting. If so, this could impact hunting opportunities for some herds. But wolves, big game, and hunting can and do coexist, as is demonstrated by abundant big game and hunter harvest in states with wolves, including in Alaska, and the Great Lakes states and the Northern Rocky Mountains. So we can actually look to the Northern Rocky Mountains for some insights on this issue. And this is data uh, that taken from Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, and it's the number of elk harvested by hunters each year. And you can see that on a statewide basis, the number of elk uh, harvested by hunters has not declined over the past 20 years, despite a significant increase in wolf populations in the state. And these same trends are evident at a statewide level for both Idaho and Wyoming. That's at a statewide level. Now at a local level, the effects of wolves can vary. For example, the data show us that elk numbers are stable or increasing in some areas where wolves and elk interact around the Yellowstone region. But in other areas, elk numbers have declined due in part to wolf predation. So if wolves were fully restored to Colorado, we might expect something similar. We might expect local impacts on some herds and some hunting opportunities, particularly when wolf predation is acting in conjunction with other factors that limit big game. But we would not expect a, a large impact on big game and hunting at a statewide level. And finally, there's been considerable discussion about the ecological impacts of wolves, the potential for this top predator to generate effects that ripple through food webs. And so what does the science tell us on this? Well, studies primarily in Yellowstone have suggested that wolves might help reduce overbrowsing by elk and deer, which may allow vegetation to recover and improve habitat for other animals such as songbirds or beavers. But science also tells us that the effects of wolves are very complex and, the, and wolves we're likely not solely responsible for the types of ecosystem changes that have been documented in Yellowstone over the past 20 years since the reintroduction. It's also unclear to what extent those kinds of impacts might translate to other systems outside of national parks, including in Colorado. So in short, it's a complicated story. But what we might expect in Colorado is that wolves might have a noticeable ecological effects where they occur in high enough densities for a long enough time. But in other areas with lower density of wolves, the ecological effects will be less evident. So ultimately, wildlife managers have a variety of tools to manage predators, big game, and hunter harvest. For example, regulated hunting of big game and predators can be manipulated to achieve management goals. Science also indicates that habitat quality is often a stronger driver of big game populations than is predation. So another option is to protect and to manage big game habitat to ensure thriving herds. And then finally, scientific monitoring of big game and predator populations can help ensure that the numbers of predators and prey on the landscape achieves the desired balance. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague and friend, Dr. Stuart Breck, to talk about the impacts of wolves and livestock and to uh, give more concluding material for this presentation. Stuart. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so before I get started, just a, a quick correction. I'm not a professor at uh, Colorado State University. I'm a research biologist um, at, with Wildlife Services at the National Wildlife Research Center. I do do a lot of work in conjunction with CSU and Kevin and others at CSU. Uh, but I just want to make that clear. It's important because Wildlife Services is, is, plays a, a big role in, in um, managing wolves and managing particularly the, the potential conflict that can occur between wolves and, and the livestock industry. And that's where I uh, will focus my talk tonight and uh, address questions about. <clears throat> I've been at the National Wildlife Research Center for 20 years and um, I was hired uh, to develop non-lethal tools specifically for, for wolf management, um, but also other carnivores as well. So I've spent a lot of time in Arizona and New Mexico with the Mexican Wolf Project, 
um, in Idaho, Montana, places like that, um, developing tools, testing tools, learning more about wolves. So I wanted to cover two things tonight. Um, one of the questions is what are the impacts of wolves on livestock? And then secondly, what can we do to minimize impacts? And so if we look at um, impacts of wolves on livestock, there's, there's various ways of looking at it. One way is to take, and this is data from the state of Montana and to say, well, of all the, um, the mortality that occurs to livestock, what, what is caused by wolves? And if you look at it that way, you'll see a, about 1% of unwanted losses are, are caused by wolves. And then if you ask, well, how many, how many um, uh, cattle within the state that, that have approximately 4 million cattle, how many die by wolves? That uh, accounts for less, uh, about 0.02% of total inventory. Um, and so you could say, you could conclude from that, well, wolves don't really have much of an impact, but hold on, that's maybe not a, uh, a correct or fair way of looking at things. And I say that because the impacts of, of wolves on the livestock industry um, are, are very localized, meaning some producers are going to have um, a lot of impact, most aren't going to have an impact. And um, there's various ways of looking at impact and our, um, our ways of measuring impact are, are, are not sometimes not real good. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's define direct impact. Direct impact is, is when we know a wolf comes into um, livestock and kills, uh, kills a cow or, or a sheep or something. And we are able to quantify like, okay, yes, this wolf killed this, this sheep. A lot of times though, we have livestock on the landscape where they, are, um, they may be killed by wolves or other predators and we just don't know about it. So those are unmeasured direct impacts. There's also indirect impacts that are also hard to measure. And those ind indirect impacts are, what are the impacts of wolves on the behavior of livestock? Does that influence their weight gain? Does that influence their pregnancy rates? things like that. And then um, the thing that's often not um, captured in the statistics is that there's a real emotional component to uh, these predation events. And so I've, I've shared some pictures and I, and granted the, they're a bit gruesome, but this is uh, the reality sometimes of having wolves on, on the landscape. This will occur in Colorado. Um, wolves do prey on livestock. Um, on your left, you see a sheep with, with uh, baby lambs that were killed by a predator. In, in the middle is a, is a guard dog. So livestock guard dogs are common across landscapes to protect particularly sheep. Um, and occasionally they can be um, confront wolves and a lot of times they'll um, be killed by wolves or can be killed by wolves. And this often results in the picture on the right um, is a wolf killing cattle. And then somebody coming in, um, sometimes my agency, sometimes other agencies, and having to, to euthanize wolves or kill wolves. And so the question I really want to focus on tonight is, well, what can we do to minimize these impacts? How can we minimize the number of wolves killing livestock? And then how can we minimize the need to kill wolves? So the first step in this is, um, we really start, we really need to start with accurate data collection. And that is at, at the ground level, that is having trained personnel that are able to basically kind of do a CSI type investigation when, when there's dead livestock on the ground. And this is a really stressful job. Um, you need somebody that's trained in necropsy. They're able to skin out these uh, dead livestock, look for the signs that indicate predators. They're taking a lot of evidence from around the, the kill site. There's a lot that goes into this. There's also a tremendous amount of pressure. Oftentimes you have, you'll have a rancher watching you. There's pressure to say, yes, there, this is a wolf kill, especially if there's a compensation uh, uh, program in place. So the, my point here is that you really need some professionals that are good at taking the pressure and are good at their job. Um, Wildlife Services does a lot of this work but so do state game agencies. But this is a critical first step in having wolves on the ground. The second thing 
I wanted to talk about is, is being able to say, okay, where are we more likely to have wolf, conf, uh, wolf livestock conflict? And so this is a, an example from a project I was involved with in Arizona and New Mexico. And so these maps represent Arizona and New Mexico combined. And really what we're trying to do is take what we know about where wolves are. And that's often, if we know where elk are, and we know where deer are, um, then we can overlay that with where we know the livestock are. And on the right, you'll see a picture of, uh, with a lot of blue, but then there's yellow and red. Those red areas are the hot spots. And so that's where, um, if we can really develop some good idea of where the hot spots, we think the hot spots are gonna be, we can apply resources in a proactive way, get in there early, start working with people, helping them understand how, what it's like to live with wolves. A big part of my job and a big part of, I think what could um, still needs to be done is developing and evaluating management tools. There's a whole lot of things out there that we can use, a lot of them um, to prevent, uh, you know, interactions between wolves and livestock that include barriers and scare devices, if we can, um, or utilizing guard dogs. My agency does a lot of work with developing guard dogs. We've looked at uh, bringing in larger guard dogs that are be maybe better to, better able to um, deal with wolves versus some of the guard dogs that are more standard for uh, use uh, guarding against coyotes. Um, we've done work on looking at human presence. That means like range riders out on the range or um, shepherding, things like that. How does that affect things? Um, if, if the livestock owners are um, willing and able to alter grazing strategies, sometimes that can help or reduce attractants on the ground. All these are things that we can do to help minimize the conflict. I also want to um, emphasize that the, the need to, to occasionally um, remove wolves via lethal control um, should be on the table. It's something that, that is, uh, can be an important management tool in certain situations. Now, lethal control is something that no one really wants to do. Uh, sometimes it's necessary, but if you pull it off the table, it's a mistake. So a cautionary tale about tools is that really a tool is only as good as a person using it. What I'm saying is that we can, we can have all these tools in our toolbox, but if people aren't willing to implement them in the proper way, then tools are less effective. And so this graph is meant to sort of depict the complexity of, of this issue. Well, why don't we just develop these non-lethal tools that um, everybody can use? It's not that simple. There's a lot that goes into understanding it. There's economics that goes into whether these tools are used. There's knowledge about the carnivore ecology, how well the tools work. And then most importantly, probably, is these attitudes and beliefs and perceptions about these tools. It really boils down to what's the culture. We have a lot of people that have um, uh, been raising livestock in areas without wolves. And so wolves are a new thing. And, and um, changing you the way you do your practice uh, is, is, can be a big ask. And there's a lot of uh, inertia against that, that uh, use of new tools. So I'm just, I'm pointing out that the, it's not a simple thing to just say, let's use these non-lethal tools. It's, uh, it's fairly complex. But there are some good examples of people coexisting with um, uh, wolves and other large predators on the, on the uh, on the ground. And I want to use this example out of Montana. Um, if you're interested in getting more information, I'd encourage you to look up the Blackfoot Challenge. And basically what this is, this was a, a, a group of ranchers, a big group of ranchers up in Montana um, that started working together. And they invited, recognizing that there's a lot of environmental problems re related to water use, um, forestry management, and living with large predators. And so they came together, they invited federal agencies, state agencies, NGOs to all work together to try to solve these problems in a, in a different way. It's been very successful. So what does success look like? This is a graph. The graph in the yellow shows the wolf number of wolves that exist in this area of the Blackfoot Challenge. The red line represents the number of wolves that are killed um, for management purposes, not via hunting. And then the white line represents the number of livestock losses. 
over time. And what you see is very low numbers of livestock losses, low numbers of wolves killed, and it's um, a, a good self-sustaining population of wolves in this area. That's what we're shooting for with coexistence. And so part of what the Blackfoot Challenge does is they do a lot of preventative work. They clean up carcasses off the landscape, they um, use range riding and other non-lethal tools in a real preventative way, and they're, they're a very successful model. And so how will we deal with the challenges of wolves in Colorado? So this, this, um, this issue is often divided into real diversive or di divisive, um, strongly opinionated groups and that are loud and vocal. And, and so how we handle that is, is a real important challenge and it really comes down to people and not necessarily wolves in, in if, if Colorado chooses to restore wolves or if wolves are allowed to return here. And I, and I believe we have a choice and really the choice is we can have a, a really hot flaming inferno of uh, conflict between people where people, and what does that look like? It looks like people uh, yelling at each other, a lot of um, uh, hateful statements made towards each other, a lot of litigation. Um, it also means probably more livestock that are killed, more wolves that are killed, or we can have sort of a slow burn. There's going to be problems, but we can handle them in better ways. We know this, um, and it requires cooperation. It requires people working together, re requires compromise, and it requires utilizing the tools we have and utilizing them in a smart way. And so how do we achieve that, that, that better way of doing things? I really think this is the most important point. It's purposeful gathering of, of stakeholders that are, are um, really um, impassioned about this uh, um, idea of wolves in Colorado. Some people hate it, some people love it. We need those people to come together and to talk it out and to find the compromise, find where we can work together, um, combine resources so that the ranchers are not um, as impacted as uh, can, can happen. So I have a lot of actual hope if Colorado goes that way, that we can move in this direction. And, and really the science that needs to be done is, is more about the people than it is about uh, uh, wolves. And we know how to bring wolves back. What we need to really focus on is how can we bring people together? So as a bit of a humor, I think probably the most important part of my job is really sitting down with people um, from all different sides and, and talking things out. And this includes um, uh, finding the compromise, finding, educating, figuring out um, you know, how people feel about different aspects of wolves in Colorado. These are really important parts of the science and, and part, parts of restoring uh, wolves to Colorado. If you wanna learn more about wolves, um, the, the, the Center for Human Carnivore Coexistence has developed a lot of FAQs. There's a lot of information there. I encourage you to, to visit that website. And with that, I believe we shall, we'll come back with questions. Great, thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we are blowing up in the chat with questions, which is a great thing. So we've got about a half an hour here that John and I are gonna try not to step on each other's toes, ears, toes, and, and walk us through a discussion. Um, I'm gonna take the prerogative and throw out the first one. Um, and I want, I would love both of you to answer this if that's okay. And, and the question I have is, there's a lot, as you both pointed out, of some heat and some passion and there's coverage and there's information coming from all different sides. So I'm wondering if both of you could speak to maybe one major misconception that you've read or that you've heard that you'd like to clarify. And I'm looking, maybe Kevin, do you wanna start first? Sure. Uh, well, that's a very good question. You know, one of the reasons why we've decided to engage on this issue is that there is so much um, misinformation out there on really kind of all sides about this issue. Um, in, in general, what I'll say is that the effects of wolves, if restored to Colorado, tends to be overplayed. It, it tends to be ex exaggerated. And I'd say the biggest disconnect between sort of what people perceive might happen and what the reality is, 
regarding wolves is about that human safety issue. You know, the, the direct threats of wolves to humans, the fear that they might attack people or attack our kids, that is something that we've found often comes up in public discourse and in media coverage on this issue. I'll put in a quick plug for my colleague, uh, Dr. Becky Nemec, who will be talking next week at the webinar about uh, some of her social science work analyzing uh, media uh, portrayals of the wolf issue. And this human safety issue often comes up, but in reality, wolves are uh, occupy a, a, are a, a low threat to people. I gave you some statistics, statistics. I can give you another. You know, you know, four million people visit Yellowstone every year, including a lot of tent campers. And there's been no instances of wolves attacking or killing people. So this, if, if there was one misperception that I would want to correct, one that's pervasive in the discourse right now, it's on human safety. I guess it, I'd jump in here. I think there's a, there are a lot of misperceptions and if I had to identify one, I'll stick to my wheelhouse and, it, and that deals with um, the role of non-lethal tools. And I kind of touched on this earlier. Um, there's a, a perception among some um, uh, stakeholders that if you have these non-lethal tools that they'll always work and that that's all that we need to solve this, this problem with livestock. And, um, and it, as I was saying earlier, it's just not that easy. There are some good tools, but they require, they require some finesse, they require some education, they require some new ways of thinking um, to really make them work effectively. Can I jump back in here again? Um, just in general, I would say a misperception is that they're gonna have larger impacts than they probably will. You know, impacts to big game, impacts to livestock, impacts to ecosystems, the top-down effects of these wolves. I think they're often exaggerated. You know, it's interesting. Wolves evoke such strong passion uh, and polarization. We have a long history, humans, of living with wolves. And I, so I, I think that that's part of the issue here, that this is really deep. And there's a lot of mythology uh, about wolves. And therefore, those misperceptions and mythology has kind of gone th uh, through us for, for generations. So Kevin, I was wondering if you could explain to us a little bit about the policy context in which we're operating right now. So uh, this uh, Proposition 114 will, um, will direct the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission to restore wolves, to reintroduce wolves to Colorado. Colorado Parks and Wildlife, our wildlife management agency, is not here tonight on tonight's panel. Uh, they have extraordinary wildlife expertise. They're not here because this is a ballot proposition and they can't speak on such things prior to the vote. But in their absence, can you tell us what is the status of wolves right now? And then if the ballot initiative passes, what is the role of Colorado Parks and Wildlife and Fish and Wildlife Service and, and other agencies that are responsible for policy and management? That is a great question, John. It's uh, one that I think is confused often in, again, discourse about this issue. And it's one that's sort of complicated, but I'll try, uh, which is that right now, any wolves in Colorado are still considered endangered under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. So, so that means that the federal government and specifically the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has management authority of wolves in Colorado uh, and not Colorado parks and wildlife. And that includes any wolves that naturally migrate into the state. As long as wolves are listed under the ESA, it's the Fish and Wildlife Service, the feds, that have management authority. Now, if ballot Proposition 114 passes, and if wolves are still listed as endangered under the ESA, then a permit for reintroduction would be required from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, from the feds, to do the reintroduction. So if that permit is secured, 
then Colorado Parks and Wildlife would then be responsible for developing and implementing the, the wolf reintroduction plan. Now, the reason why this is sort of complicated, and it's a fluid, it's a fluid situation right now, is that the, you, the feds, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, now considers wolves to be stable and healthy through their current range in the lower 48. So they've concluded that the gray wolf is not in danger of extinction and therefore should be removed or delisted from the Endangered Species Act. So back in spring of 2019, they proposed to remove all gray wolves in the continental United States, except for a subspecies of Mexican wolf, but the rest of wolves in the lower 48, gray wolves, from protection under the ESA. So if that happens, if they are delisted from the Endangered Species Act, this would then turn management of wolves back to individual state wildlife agencies. I hope that, I hope that was clear. Was that clear, John? I think so, thank you. It's complicated. It is complicated. <laughs> well, it, I mean, and, and literally, we, if you've you know, read the news, the, 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 um, the executive branch, the Trump administration, has suggested that they are going to try to push through delisting wolves in the Endangered Species Act this fall. It could happen sooner rather than later. And so it, it, it puts in some uncertainty with this ballot initiative happening at the same time, is that who would be sort of what would be necessary to reintroduce wolves to Colorado. Let me build on that a little bit too, so we can get a little into the technical details about numbers. Um, so, and an audience had kind of asked this question too, so it kind of blends into this conversation. They had read actually in the Colorado Sun that a self-sustaining population of, is between 80 and 100 wolves. So I'm curious, how do we conduct the census of wolf population? Um, you know, what, what is that target for a sustaining population? And then maybe Stuart, you can bring on the component of if, if we exceed that population number, uh, what does that look like? When would we exceed that? And when would management need to come? So maybe can we get unpack the three of those? and Kevin, do you want to start and then hand that over to Stuart? Sure. Well, I, I don't think that the scientific studies haven't been conducted yet to fully know what a viable population of wolves would be in Colorado or how many wolves Colorado could support in total. So I, I hadn't heard that 80 to 100. What I do know is that currently Colorado Parks and Wildlife estimate, I think from what I see in the media, is that there's four wolves in the state. That certainly isn't a viable population uh, in terms of long term. Um, but I think it's yet to be determined how many wolves Colorado could support. There have been some studies. They're somewhat dated now. One study conducted about 15 years ago suggested that Colorado could support at least 400 wolves. Um, and that was even project after projecting future human population, population growth. So I, I think that that's one that's one avenue that we could still do more work and want to try to estimate how many wolves Colorado could support. I think it's important to state though that Colorado still can support a viable population of wolves. There's enough habitat, there's enough, um, there's enough prey for, for uh, it to support a viable population. Stuart, do you want to speak to what would happen if it seems like there are too many wolves and too much conflict? Yeah, and um, you know, they think there's, I think it, it's important to separate uh, conflict from the wolf population. I don't know how, how much good data there is to support um, saying, you know, wolves over such, such and such population number, and you're gonna have, um, you know, this much growth in conflict. But I do know that from different states, Idaho, Montana, um, Wyoming, um, they all reached their, um, their population goal um, when they were going through the recovery phase fairly rapidly. And, um, and, and once that happened, every state was interested in implementing some type of hunting um, program so that um, they could primarily use that as a way to control the population numbers. And, and each state is different in what they've done. Um, and that, that action itself is quite, can be somewhat controversial, um, but it, it's something that we've seen in those states um, for sure. Stuart, can I ask you a little bit more about uh, lethal control with you, which you mentioned? So 
where you guys were just talking, it was about population size, um, but that that is distinct from uh, from the decisions that are made around livestock that are getting predated. We've had several of our listeners ask, why really does a wolf get killed? And why, why does yeah. a wolf have to get killed? Who makes that decision? And one thing I'm personally kind of curious about is I've heard that, you know, wolf packs have culture and that certain behaviors can be passed along among packs or within packs and, and across packs. Can you speak to that a little bit about the effectiveness of killing, why it's done, and, and um, who makes the decision? Yeah, so there's a lot to unpack there. So you may have to remind me if I get off track. Um, first of all, you know, the, the, the decision to remove wolves is, there, there's often um, part of it, part of that decision is how big is your wolf pack? If you have a small wolf pack and you're trying to recover it, then how, you know, then you're going to put a lot more effort into preserving those wolves, not removing them. And so that's what we've seen um, in all the, the states that recovered wolves in the Northern Rockies. You know, there's a tremendous amount of effort trying to develop non-lethal tools to prevent the livestock conflict. We see that uh, with Arizona and New Mexico. There's a whole lot of effort that goes into not removing wolves, but because they're trying to grow the wolf population. As that wolf population grows, there's going to be more probably leeway to remove wolves. And, um, and, and so and we've seen that. So as the population grows, there's, there's the, the use of lethal control becomes more, um, more uh, part of the management program. So um, that's one thing. Do wolves have culture? And I think I'll, I'll kind of reframe your, your question to that of um, do wolves learn and uh, do they pass on that information to their offspring? And, and I think the answer is there's pretty good science to support yes. You know, once we see a wolf learn to kill um, sheep or cattle, that, that that pack of wolves, will you'll see a recurrence of that behavior. And in fact, it's a really important point to, to the use of non-lethal tools. You have to be in there before these um, occurrences happen before a wolf kills um, livestock. If if you're if you try to implement non-lethal tools after that happens, then you're behind the, the eight ball immediately, and it becomes much harder to make these tools effective. So that whole um, process of wolves transferring behavior within individuals is an important component of all of this, and we've learned that over time. And, and there's, there's, there's been a lot of recognition of that and a real emphasis on, on let's get the resources and the tools out to the producers before we start having problems. And it's something that we're really, that um, I'm really keen on engaging here in Colorado. We should be out at the front of this, educating what are these tools out there that are available? How can we prevent some of this? Because you're right, once wolves learn to kill livestock, Boy, you know, the, our non-lethal tools start shrinking in terms of effectiveness and, and what we can pull out of the toolbox. And then we have to rely more on, on the lethal control. Let me pick up a little bit on that and, and shift our conversation a little further. So, you know, you were speaking about producers and you both spoke a little bit about bringing people together to the table. So the idea a little bit behind co-creation, right? And, and this idea of potentially there's co-creation in science or maybe there's co-creation in management and, and having people involved. I'm wondering, you know, where, where could we go with that, you know, both through a science lens and a management lens um, to do things better so that things feel like they're very useful to the communities or to the producers that need the information. Well, I can speak uh, some to that. I, I think there's a growing movement in science and, and maybe not specifically academic science, but certainly in academia is to not just generate knowledge ourselves and then disseminate that knowledge, but rather work collaboratively with diverse groups to, as you said, co-produce knowledge to ensure that science is translated to real world action. And, and that really requires working together with a diverse groups. So 
we, you know, interdisciplinary scientists, practitioners, stakeholders on all sides of the issue work together from the beginning to even to formulate the questions in science. And that can help then have increased the probability that the science we conduct is ultimately um, accepted and used in the real world. Because ultimately that's our, our job that's my job. I can just speak to this real quickly as an academic. As an academic, uh, I think we could do a much better job of, of disseminating our science, of linking our science to policy, of moving beyond the, the ivory tower. And I think wolves are actually a really good example of that. I mean, wolves are, is a highly contentious issue. It's highly debated. There's a lot of misinformation out there. And so our team up at CSU felt that the general public and, and um, policymakers would benefit from a reliable source of science-based information on wolves. And you know, CSU specifically, it's a land-grant university. A key mission of a land-grant institution is to apply knowledge to, to directly benefit the citizens of the state, in this case, Colorado. It's literally part of my job description. So my job description, I, I teach college students. I do scientific research, but another part of my job description is outreach and engagement to the real world. And I think that often that is overlooked, to be honest, looking in the mirror it, within academia. And so I, 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 I think now, perhaps more than ever, we can argue that science needs to inform policy, right? I know that that's what you're doing with your institute science and policy. We can look to COVID, we can look to climate change, we can look to wolves, where science can actually help inform some of these decisions. Yeah, and I can speak to that specifically with wolves from um, maybe more on the ground perspective and being in this field for 20 years. And when I first started, it was very common for, say, environmental groups. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll pick out a couple because I work closely with them now. Um, uh, Defenders of Wildlife and NRDC. And when I first started, it was, it was a, I guess, a hateful relationship is maybe how you would say it, um, where it, there was a lot of litigation about what wildlife services would do or Fish and Wildlife Service would do. Um, but over time, over the past 20 years, what's been really interesting to watch um, and to experience is how some of these groups have started um, embracing this notion of okay, let's, let's work with, with producers on the ground that, that are willing to work with these, these kinds of groups. Um, let's work with the state agencies. There may not be everything that decisions made that we don't like, but for, for the most part, you know, we're, we're, they're able to bring resources, they're able to bring energy um, and experience to, to the, the idea of coexisting with, with carnivores. And so some interesting, um, strange relationships, if you will, have developed that are very meaningful between wildlife services and some of these NGOs, as well as wildlife services in, in the agricultural community and, and that whole mix. And so I think that's an important, like if, if I had a target for people to, to aim for, that's what, I would, that's what I would push for is like, how can we find that common ground to work together? Um, it, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do because there's a lot of um, inertia against that. Some of the producers probably don't want to be bothered with this, probably don't want to have to deal with this new kind of animal on the landscape. And, and so a lot, some of that just takes time and, and, and um, patience and, 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 you know, taking the time to, to spend with these people to learn what they're dealing with. I can add a, a point there as well going back to some of the scientific studies about on wolves and really throughout the, so wolves are one of the most well-studied carnivore out there on the planet. And they occur, occur globally in the Northern hemisphere. Uh, and throughout the range of wolves, uh, scientific studies have indicated that human tolerance of wolves, the degree to which humans will tolerate them on the landscape is, is the key determinant if they can persist in an area. So as Stuart said, you know, a key takeaway I would have is that wildlife management is more about people than it is about wildlife. And that is definitely the case with wolves. So ultimately, 
if wolves are restored to Colorado, these kinds of collaborative approaches that incorporate a range of stakeholders are going to be really important, not just to minimize conflict between, between people and wolves, but importantly, to minimize conflict between people about, about wolves. And, and I know that that's something that you all will be talking about next week and in prior uh, uh, subsequent webinars, uh, the, the sort of the human dimension component to the wolf issue. Thank you both for that. Let me let John have the final question here. Yeah, um, just an, another uh, biological question uh, that I think is mainly for you, Kevin. I know you've written about this, and that is about disease. We've had a, uh, a couple of our listeners um, wonder about the role of, of uh, wolves in disease transmission or what happens if they eat an elk with chronic wasting disease, are they gonna then spread that around? Can you say a little bit about that piece of this puzzle? Yeah, and I can. Um, I, I'm not a, a wildlife vet, but I know some, so maybe that gives me some <laughs> credence. No, um, I can talk to chronic wasting disease briefly. Um, so CWD is a contagious, it's a fatal neurological disease found in ungulates, in deer, elk, and moose. It's uh, relatively widespread in, in Colorado. So two points about the CWD issue. One is that wolves are predators that chase prey. And so they're called coursing predators. So you know they, they run and they tend to target slower, more vulnerable individuals, including sick or diseased animals. One study that was conducted, it was a modeling study. So, so not like real world data, but theoretical models suggested that this kind of selective predation of wolves targeting animals that were sick might help limit CWD in, in deer compared to hunting by humans who might target more prime animals, okay? But that hasn't been field tested. There is one interesting field study actually in, in Spain that showed that wolf predation on sick wild boar helped to control tuberculosis. Now we do have some field studies here in Colorado, actually in part conducted by Colorado Parks and Wildlife in the front range of Colorado, showing that mule deer killed by mountain lions were more likely to be infected with CWD than mule deer killed by hunt, on, on hunters. So it's sort of an interesting analogy. Mountain lions are ambush predators. They sit and wait for prey. So they're actually less likely to target diseased animals than are, are wolves. So that's the first part. Just quickly, the second part is that a C, so the CWD is, is uh, an organism that, re, uh, that is a prion that, that uh, can remain infectious in carnivore feces. So it can be spread in carnivore feces, but it is degraded in their digestive tract. So the data so far, the science so far, suggests that the carnivores themselves, wolves themselves, wouldn't necessarily spread CWD across the landscape. We're getting close to wrapping up, actually, but I do want to give our guests maybe just 30 seconds of one kind of final perspective to leave our audience with about what do you hope they take away from today or, or what do you hope for next steps in these conversations? Stuart, why don't you start and then we'll finish with Kevin and wrap up tonight's talk. Yeah, so I think, you know, I, my hope would be we do things differently in Colorado if in fact the ballot passes or even if it doesn't that um, we can um, not have so much of the vitriol and the um, the, the kind of the, the the hatred if you will that's associated sometimes with wolves um, and I think that I think there's I think we know how to do that and there's some people within uh, human dimensions department there's there's um, there's this understanding across agencies that um, we can we can do this and so that's I think that's what I'd like to leave is that's that hope and just to add quickly I know we're almost out of time I, I would just encourage everybody first of all thank you for attending and, and hearing us I would encourage everybody to educate themselves on this issue and hear people hear people with other opinions because I think that's really important. 
of course, as a scientist, I'm hoping that people are more informed about the science. So as a plug, again, go to our website, Center for Human Carnivore Coexistence, and, and, and there's a lot of information there about the science behind the wolf issue. And I think we're ending just in time because I'm about to get my vitamin D fix here. <laughs> I see that sunlight slowly moving in. I kind of had the same thing. I was expecting it to any minute hit me right in the middle of the eyes. So I, you, go ahead. Kudos to you, you and John for putting this on and, and thank you for everybody's time. Oh no, thank you both. And, and let me just thank our audience. You all were thoughtful, you were engaged. We had so many questions. We could definitely not get to all of them um, as to be expected. But I do wanna just plug a few more things for those of you who still stayed in for the full hour, which has been a tremendous number, is this is the first in five. So next week, same time, same place, Thursday, 5 p.m. Mountain Time, other times, depending on what time zone you're in. And so next week, we're gonna talk about media perspective, uh, media coverage and public perceptions. And so I think I heard Kevin mention his colleague, Becky Nimik, Nimik. And we're also gonna have Sam Brash from Colorado Public Radio joining us next Thursday. And then we've got one for the following three Thursdays after that. So we encourage you to tune in for all of these. They're all gonna be different with really exciting guests. Um, a quick plug and reminder for that survey that John mentioned at the beginning, check your confirmation email for every email, for everyone you register for, you'll get that link to that survey. You just need to fill it out once. It's a pre-survey and then you'll get the post-survey at the end. Um, we do encourage that. That's participating in a science survey. So that's exciting. Um, we're gonna drop in our handles here to social media. We encourage you to follow both the Institute and all of our CSU colleagues on social media. You can stay up to date, get the latest on the science, hear what the conversations are happening, stay informed of what we're doing um, elsewhere in our work too. We're also gonna drop a link to those fact sheets that you saw. Um, all three of our, my guests here tonight were deeply involved in putting that information together. They're really accessible, they're really great. I encourage you to read them and share them as widely as you want. Um, so thank you to my partners. Thank you, John, you were wonderful co-host and co-moderator. We did it, right? And uh, it. thank you thank you all to our audience for tuning in tonight. Uh, we will send a written recap up and we have a recording of this that you'll have a link to. Feel free to distribute that widely. And if we get a chance, we may try to put additional few of those lightning round questions that we did not get to in the write-up as well too and get those addressed for you because we had so many. So thank you and hope to see you all next Thursday. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.